I'm Peter Rivera. Oh, me too. I'm Ben Vereen. And I love StageBuddy.com. And you should too. We are here with the incredible Mark Nadler. He is up for a Mac Award for Celebrity Artist. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> that cracks me up that I'm Celebrity Artist because... Yes, you I are. I mean, even you had to say, is it Nadler or Nadler? It's like <laughs> some fucking celebrity. Nobody's ever heard of me. Oh. But no, 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 but it's fine. If they want to call me a celebrity at the Mac Awards, I'm, I'm honored. Well, yes, you are. I mean, you uh, have... A, <laughs> <laughs> List of accolades you've got. Won. I've got accolades. You've I've got won. credits. I've been doing this a long time. Exactly. Well, you have 14 awards. I have won a total of 14 awards so yes. far. So far. Of yes, course, exactly. Tonight we could make it 16. <laughs> <laughs> Along with Mac Awards that you have already won, you have also have Bistro Award, Broadway World, Nightlife and San Francisco Critic Circle Awards. Yep. How and impressive. two Drama Desk nominations, and I yes. was nominated for a, a Helpman Award, which is the Tony Awards in Australia. That was sort of thrilling, you know. I flew down to Sydney for the weekend to oh be at the gosh. Helpman Awards because it's televised all over that part of the world. Uh huh. And I wasn't going to miss that, so I flew down to Sydney for the weekend, you know. Who does yeah. that? <laughs> and it uh, takes a weekend to get there. Yeah, all right. <laughs> I rehearsed it in front of my people in my speech, and I got my speech all ready, and I'm sitting there, and of course I didn't win. Oh. But it's worse than that. They didn't televise the cabaret part. <gasps> oh my goodness. No, it was like the cabaret part was like part of like in the Oscars where they have, the, you know, documentary camera. or whatever it is that nobody's interested in. And oh. That's what cabaret is in Australia, but at least it made it to the, their version of the Tony Awards. Absolutely. You have performed all over the world on some of the finest stages on Carnegie Hall and here in Town Hall. The Mann Center in Philadelphia, which is, uh, it's a 14,000 seat wow. outdoor amphitheater. I was, it was me and the New York Pops. Oh my First goodness. Two acts, just me and uh -huh. them, 75 musicians and me. and. Oh. And it was certainly the largest crowd I've ever played to, and it was, it was pretty thrilling. Oh wow, that is incredible! What it was an amazing fun. memory! I have all sorts of amazing memories. I'm I sure. I was in Adelaide, Australia. There, I actually am a celebrity, and and I know that because I was riding the subway here one day, and this girl is like looking at me, and she gets out her phone and she's taking pictures of me, and I, <sighs> and I go over to her, I said, "Excuse me, but I suspect I'm not." who you think I am, why, why are you, she said, aren't you Mac Nadler? And I said, that came out Jewish because I, I can't do an Australian accent, I can only do Jewish and Puerto Rican. But it was an Australian girl and I Mark said, Ed, Ma Mark Mac Nadler. Nadler, and I said, Mike Nadler. Ma and I said, and I said, yeah, yeah, not. she says, I love you, I never have oh. missed you ever in, 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 in she's from Adelaide. Uh -huh. So anyway, I come out on stage one, this was three years ago. I come out on stage in Adelaide for my opening night. They were all wearing masks of my face. Oh my the God. The entire audience. I mean, you want to know what it is to be a celebrity? I found out that night. The entire audience is looking up at me with my face. Oh my goodness. It was the most surreal I was thing, just... <laughs> but wonderful. I'm right? sitting there thinking, Oh my God, you made it. Well, I mean, you, you've been doing this now, what were you saying, 43 years? This summer will be 43 years as a professional Mark, in show business. I had my goodness. first job, I was almost 11. I got myself a job playing piano and singing at a place called the Long Straw Saloon in <laughs> Cedar Falls, Iowa. Then when I uh, graduated from high school, I came directly to New York. I didn't, I didn't go to college, I went right into came right to New York to go into the business. Uh -huh. And I have supported myself doing this ever since. And I'm not done yet. Exactly, you still got <laughs> a long way to I go. Hope. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you are one of the rare human beings that has managed to make a healthy career out mm. of cabaret. I'm lucky, but you know, a lot of it has to do with the fact that I play the piano for myself. Uh -huh. I don't have to pay. I mean, I now do work with other musicians. Right. 
but for a long time, I didn't work with anybody else. Uh -huh. I didn't hire a director. I didn't have to hire a musical director. I do my own arrangements. Mm -hmm. When I sing with symphony orchestras, I do my own orchestration. Wow, so that's brilliant. So the fact that I could do all of that and didn't have to pay other people to do it right, meant right. that the salaries I was getting, I could keep. Yep, exactly. That exactly. makes a huge difference uh -huh. in making a living. But my gosh, I mean, talk about multifaceted. I'm, I'm assuming even at the age of 11 when you first started, well, you started learning. Well, when I was 11, I was playing. Learning, le but you were learning piano, you were learning. Well, I already knew how, how to, to play the piano at that, okay. uh, at that age, or I wouldn't be able to have got, I wouldn't have gotten that job. I started right. playing piano when I was five. Oh my goodness. But uh -huh. I actually played pretty well for an 11 year old. Right, right. But really, when I became a musician, of consequence. Mm -hmm. When I really started to know music, started to know chords, started mm -hmm. to know uh, uh, composition and and the structure and structure and mm -hmm. arranging is when I got to New York and I started and I was working at the Five Oaks. I've I've heard you of it. You didn't no. go to the Five Oaks. Oh I my moved here. God, and... you missed out. <laughs> the Five Oaks was this place. It was on Grove and Bleecker. Okay. And there was this woman named Marie Blake who played there. Uh -huh. She was. I played there for six years and she was ancient when I met her and she was this old black woman. She had this, she wore her hair, it was this braid on the top of her head. We called it the burnt croissant. <laughs> and it was, and Marie was spectacular in her ability to make every song sound the same. <laughs> every song. <laughs> she, she, she had this old croaky voice and she always did the same thing with her left hand. Dumb. Dum, 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 no matter what the song, dum, dum, memories, bum, bum, all alone in the moon, bum, 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 isn't it rich, bum, 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 isn't it swell, bum, but she did Blondie's, she did Blondie's, um, Rapture, fly by Freddy Anderson and the man from Mars is eating cars, dum, dum, right, so the, you can see this on YouTube, go to YouTube, Look at Marie Blake singing Rapture. I don't know what you do to get high, but do it before you look at this. It is, it's from heaven. So anyway, that was my job. I was playing between her sets. Oh, because okay. she was 972 years old. She needed to break. The shift was 9 p.m. till 4 a.m. Oh my goodness. So she'd play for 40 minutes and then She'd go in the back and fall asleep, and I'd play until she woke up, and then she'd come back out and she'd play some more, and then I'd pin when she needed to sleep, I'd go. <laughs> I loved that job at the Five Oaks. We had a good time down there. It mm -hmm. was one of these places where just anything could happen. Oh, and I'm it sure. It did. Uh -huh. It was terrific. It was terrific. Especially when the doors are open for the entertainment community to come in. Yeah, and so people like Liza would come down there, uh -huh. and Bette Midler would come down there and hang out right next to some tragic drag queen who isn't even trying to pass for a woman and her balls are hanging out. I mean, it's like, <laughs> and everybody's sitting next to each other. It was I love it. I love and that. And the, there was this guy named Dennis the Cowboy. Dennis the Cowboy would always get up and he'd sing tie yellow ribbon around the old woman. Yeah. And people would wave their napkins when he sang. He could not sing two notes in a row next to each other in tune. He was the worst singer you've ever heard in your entire life. The audience loved him uh -huh. because that was what the place was about. It was the best, it was the I worst. I love was, that. Yeah, it was sort of out of Dickens. <laughs> the best of singers and the worst of singers. But, it <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, people would come in with music and you had to accompany them. Oh, okay. At that point, I hadn't wow. accompanied people. Uh-huh. And people will put music in front of you. You have to be able to play it. You have right. to be able to read it. Sight read. So the learning curve was steep. Uh -huh. And that's when I really like took it upon myself to learn how to not embarrass myself. Uh -huh. That if somebody puts a piece of music in front of you, you can read it. I learned to play by ear. That's an amazing skill. So, well, yes, but it doesn't help you when someone puts some music in front of you and they, right. want, and they and want, then, want you to play their song the way they sing it. Absolutely. Unless you're Marie Blake and you can get away with playing the same damn left hand. <laughs> I wanted to really play it. Uh -huh. And so that's where I learned how to read. That's where, you know, someone would come in with arrangements. I was in my early 20s at this point. So mm -hmm. everything is, you know, you're impressionable and everything yeah, is right. changing your ideas. And people would come in with these wonderful arrangements that would give me ideas for what I could do nice. with my stuff. Yeah. So that was where a shift happened that, mm -hmm. I be, that I started really learning music. And then as I was going along and I was doing my act, I, my first act I did at the ballroom, I, I followed Marvin Hamlish. Marvin Hamlish was the early wow. show, I was the late show. 
I had to know what I was doing. Yeah. You know, this was, yeah. They, 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 the ballroom used to put posters of you all over town. Ah. Uh, and, you know, that was sort of a thrill. Oh, walking definitely. down the street, I'd stand in front of it. I smoked at the time, stand in front of it, smoking. Somebody yeah. walked by and said, <laughs> Are you going to go see that? that looks, <laughs> looks like a good show. I'm going to go see that. <laughs> and from there, I got cast in a Broadway show. Mm. called The Sheik of Avenue B, the single worst show ever to have been on Broadway. People would walk out during the overture. It was horrible. But I was cast in Sheik of Avenue B. It's kind of a Broadway show, kind of not. Because it was at, it, we ran at Town Hall. Okay. For 10 weeks, eight shows a week on a Broadway contract. But because it's Town Hall, we were not eligible for Tony Awards. Not that anybody oh. or anything about this show was ever in danger <laughs> of getting a Tony Award nomination. Now follow me on this. It was a, somebody had this brilliant idea to put this on stage. It was a review of songs, mainly that were cut from vaudeville. And all of the songs were about the Lower East Side. So they had to be about Jews on the Lower East Side or Irish people on the Lower, well, the thing is, at that time, all of those songs, the idea of them was to just lambaste any given community. So there's hugely oh. anti-Semitic songs, <laughs> these like anti-Irish songs, talking about wops and dagos. And I mean, thank God we weren't in blackface, but we might as well have been. I mean, it was like that. And people are wondering why no one wants to see this show. The songs were horrible and we're out there. Anyway. Amanda Green, God love her, she's as talented as can be. She really is. She's a wonderful uh -huh. songwriter. Her songs, she has uh, Broadway shows that she's written. Mm -hmm. She's a very talented woman. But Amanda is a blue jeans kind of girl. She has never not worn jeans or pants at uh -huh. least, right? See, this show takes place in 1933. Amanda, for the first time in her life, is wearing a dress. The director places her downstage, facing the audience, in a chair. So she sits there singing her song with one knee pointing toward California and one knee pointing toward Long Island in a dress. So after the first preview, my partner came backstage. My partner was a, a director and he was a brilliant guy. And I said, well, what did you think of the show? He said, well, first of all, somebody's got to get that girl a cello. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> so how did you actually enter the world of cabaret? So I would say my first job in cabaret was my first job. Mm -hmm. And the reason I did that is because I had been uh, playing piano and singing in front of audiences at that point for about five years. And I was a little gay Jew in Waterloo, Iowa. Mm -hmm. And I knew only one thing, and that is I was determined not to go to high school in that town because I valued my wow. life. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, being Jewish, I, I, I was going to run away from home, but being Jewish, I wasn't going to run away from home without money. Right. <laughs> so I got myself a job doing what it was I do. And there was this place and they had a piano bar and I, and I went in and they thought this is a good gimmick. And uh -huh. so I, I, that's how I got into the world of cabaret. And that's really, you know, playing in piano bars is where I learned everything I know. Mm -hmm. Everything I know. Because you learn how to get the audience's attention. You learn right. how to keep the audience's attention. Yeah. Because if you don't, you don't make tips. Yeah. And believe me, there's no salary there. You mm -hmm. only, you really survive on the tips. I played at Marie's Crisis. It's still going Yeah. That goddamn yeah. place. 9.30 p.m. to 3.30 a.m. was the shift. Wow. Six hours. After the third hour, you were allowed to take one 15-minute break. Wow. So most of the people who play at Marie's Crisis, they play and the crowd sings. Mm -hmm. And that's how they do it. Me being the idiot that I am, and see, I've always been under the delusion that I am going to be discovered at mm. that performance. Uh -huh. I mean, in a uh -huh. major way. It's uh -huh. like, I will be, it'll be, I that will be that. the performance when Cecil B. DeMille comes up from the grave, sees me and creates an entire film company around me. Right. But every <laughs> performance, I'm certain that this is gonna happen. So because, But that's wonderful well, motivation. Except, because of this delusion, <laughs> 
Would I let one song go by at Maurice Crisis during that entire three hour span <laughs> when I wasn't singing it the loudest, the funniest, the best? <laughs> so I sang for three hours without wow. a break with no mic. Oh my God. Screaming over these queens who were screaming at the top of their lungs. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, and then I would take a 15 minute break and then I would do it for another two hours oh and 45 minutes. Gosh. And I, I did this because, first of all, I was certain I was going to be discovered at Marie's Crisis because isn't, isn't that where every career begins? <laughs> and the other thing was in doing this, I created lots and lots of comedy routines, I not imagine. on purpose, but just like stuff, it would work and then you keep it in the act. It, right, right. And so then people would come down to see that and I made great money. It was abominable shift pay. Yeah. But I walked out with hundreds of dollars in tips. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, how do you make a living in show business? That's how I've done it. Wow. I mean, that's how I started. Yeah, yeah. And. Um, you but know. you again have built up your reputation, a very solid and loving well, I've relation. I've built up a reputation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, see, also while I was at the Five Oaks, I started getting this reputation for somebody who breaks piano strings. Oh. And somebody who breaks the piano and somebody who breaks the bench. I haven't broken a piano string probably, I don't know, in 25 years or something. But people still, I will, <laughs> I will walk into a concert hall and people will like say, now you know this is a very valuable piano. <laughs> um, you, you will be kind, won't you? <laughs> Oh, well now, do you have any words of wisdom or, <laughs> or advice for someone who may be thinking about getting into the cabaret field? <laughs> well, I could, you know, say the obvious, it's just, just simply don't do it, but it's not really how I feel about it. Uh-huh. I say do it. Yeah, you yeah. You know, here's the thing about cabaret versus being an actor Mm -hmm. singing actor, dancing actor, or being a music director in a show, or being a writer of a play. Cabaret is all you. Yeah. It's all you. It's your ideas. Mm -hmm. It's your musical ideas. It's your, at its best, it's your soul on that stage. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It, and so you don't, you can bring elements of that into other performance art forms, but cabaret is the only one where you do it all. Mm -hmm. And for that reason alone, I think it's a really wonderful thing mm -hmm. to do. It's a, it's a, I guess if I had a word of wisdom, I would say go see everybody else's act mm -hmm. for two reasons. One of them is practical. Quite frankly, you go see their act they might come see yours. Mm -hmm. And you do have to get butts in those seats. Absolutely. Um, you know, when I play at 54 Below, they, they won't have me back if I don't get a certain number of people in that audience. Mm -hmm. That's just the bottom wow. line. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's just the bottom line. Yeah. That's the business. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, nobody, I am not, I, nobody is allowed to shake my hand without me putting a postcard of my show in it. Mm -hmm. We call it the cabaret handshake. <laughs> but it's, it's what you have to do. You have to always be out there promoting yourself and your yeah. show. Otherwise, you can't get people to come see you. You don't get people to come see you. What club wants you to play their room? Absolutely. So go see other people's shows. Go see everybody else's show mm -hmm. because it will make them feel more favorable toward coming to see your show. But the other real reason to go see everybody else's show is you're gonna get ideas. Exactly, And you're learn. gonna see what works and you're gonna see what doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> come see my show to see what doesn't work. <laughs> but come see it. I uh, tend to disagree <laughs> that it, you should but, go see what works when coming you. to see your show. But honestly, you'll see what, and you'll see because the cabaret community in New York City, like nowhere else, Mm -hmm. is so creative, yeah, you'll yeah. sit there and say, oh, oh I never thought, thought you could that. do that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you know what, if they can do that, I could do that. Exactly. exactly. And so, yeah, those, that's the real word of wisdom is see everybody else's show uh -huh. and let it inspire you. Mm -hmm.
and work your ass off. In, in actuality, you have uh, your current show right now, which oh, is addicted am I glad you to the that spotlight. Up. May I do Hold this? Hold up the card. Yes, you may. Is it there? <laughs> when, I, when I did the cabaret convention, Stephen Holden, who reviews cabaret for the New mm -hmm. York Times, decided I was going to be his sacrificial lamb. Mm. And the last paragraph of the review for the cabaret convention this year was all about that, how did he put it? That incurable show off Mark Nadler who's addicted to the spotlight. We ought to have a hook for these stage hogs. And it was like this. Really, <sighs> so the thing is, I didn't read the review. I don't know these things, but I get all these emails that morning. Are you all right? Oh. And, it, Stephen Holden doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm sure you weren't that bad. <laughs> so oh I, my goodness. I didn't even read that. I'm like having my coffee and thinking, is it over so soon? <laughs> so It was a good run while it lasted. Oh my God. So I read the review and I thought, this is, this is one of the funniest things I've ever seen. I love this review. So I decided that my next show would be called Addicted to the Spotlight. Because my feeling is, Am I addicted to the spotlight? I, I have been in show business for 43 <laughs> years. What do you think, I'm doing this for the money? I, of course I'm addicted to, who isn't, duh. So anyway, so, so I said, I, my next show is gonna be called Addicted to the Spotlight. And it's gonna Perfect. be about my, my four decades in show business. And I'll flesh it out with uh, songs of two other guys to whom I've been compared a lot, in, mm -hmm. uh, who were also addicted to the spotlight, Danny Kay and Al Jolson. And uh -huh. that's what it is, that's what the show is. So Something Heather bad. Sullivan, who mm -hmm. does all of my photographs, she's a genius, um, KT's sister as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Heather took these photographs of me performing. So Frank Dane cut out the photo, you know, the image of me and superimposed me into like singing to a man who's dying in an emergency room. The man is looking at me like, <laughs> and, I'm, and, I, and I'm at him and like, going, and I'm at him like, <laughs> and, and under it is the quote, that incurable show off Mark Nadler is addicted to the spotlight. And then we sent out another one of like this man and this woman in jail. He's, he's in jail and he's behind the glass and she's there on the phone and they're, you know, trying to have their little conversation oh. and I'm standing next to them. And, <laughs> And the, and the quote is, Mark Nadler is addicted to the spotlight. Oh my God. And then the third one was a christening and everybody's around the baby and I'm behind the baby doing this. I with the same gesture, addicted to the spotlight. So anyway, that was our ad campaign for That's this show. Brilliant. It was so much fun. So I put this show together and Stephen Holden was there opening night and oh. reviewed it. The rave of my career. <laughs> The, I have never gotten a review like this in my life. He said, he said uh, with his talent and his drive, Mark Nadler is Mr. Show Business. I mean, it's like... And now he's calling you Mr. Show no, Business. No, but the thing is, Stephen Holden has been very, very good to me. Uh -huh. And I couldn't have had the career that I've had if he hadn't Right, been. nice. And that night I got on his nerves at the cabaret convention. Yeah. He's a human being. Yeah. But if you write something mean about me in the press, I'm going to use it. Yeah, that was <laughs> you know? brilliant. Well, that it was, was brilliant. I thought it was funny. I thought it was exactly. funny. Exactly. That's and not he taking thought, it too and seriously. And he thought it was funny, you know? Uh -huh. He got the joke. He's, he's a great guy, actually. Yeah. <laughs> but gave me a new show. I love it. I <laughs> love that, Mark. Well, Mark Nadler, thank you so very much for taking some time out and sitting down and chatting with us. Thank I you. I so appreciate this. It's been wonderful and a true delight. All the best on your Mac nomination for Celebrity Artist. And, and Show of the Year. Yes, and Show of the Year. For Running Wild, Songs uh -huh. and Scandals of the Roaring Twenties, which I will be doing. I'm, that, I have a CD of that show coming out oh, in May. We're launching that CD in Bethesda, Maryland. Come one, come all. <laughs> and then I'm going to be doing that show up in Provincetown okay. at the Cabaret Festival up there this, this uh, June. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, once again, Mark Nadler, thank you so very much. Thank you. <laughs>